Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. Richard Allen's attorneys take a shot at Special Judge Francis C. Gull. We got some new information about the alleged murderer of uh, Lake and Riley down there in Georgia. And cops messed up big time um, on this case down in Florida. And hey, eluding police in a stolen supercar? What could possibly go wrong? And then our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Hi, lawyer. 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 Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below. Hit that little bell for notifications. And remember, you can listen to the most fact-driven, unbiased, true crime podcast on any of your favorite podcasting apps. Before we get to today's docket, first, busy day. We had the Karen Reed trial. It has ended for the day. We still have the Chad Day Bell trial going on and the Adam Montgomery sentencing. Yeah, not a good guy at all. Anyway, take a look at that. We'll have more tomorrow as well. All right, let's go ahead and open the record for May 9th, 2024, and first on the docket. The attorneys for Richard Allen in the Delphi case. They take a shot at Francis Seagull, or I should say his attorneys, their attorneys. The attorney for the attorney of Richard Allen takes a shot at the judge. How did they do this? Well, as you remember, there was the contempt proceeding and the judge found that the prosecutor did not meet his burden to say that the attorneys for Richard Allen were in fact in violation of the gag order or that they should be held in contempt for violation of the protection order. Okay. So the attorneys um, for the attorneys for Mr. Allen filed a motion titled petition to strike gratuitous and demeaning commentary and or findings from the contempt order. And the motion is pretty straightforward. It says on January 29th, prosecutor McClellan filed his verified information of contemptuous conduct. Despite Mr. McClellan's failure to follow proper procedure, the court afforded him a hearing on his spurious allegations. Defense counsel's motion for summary denial of the state's verified information and contemptuous conduct was incorporated herein. The only issue before the court was whether Mr. McClellan, the prosecutor, could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defense counsel acted willfully and intentionally in relation to purloined discovery materials an accidentally misdirected email and violating a gag order. The court held that the prosecutor, Mr. McClellan, failed to meet that burden. And then the court referenced the preponderance of the evidence standard was unnecessary and not applicable to the issue raised. The defense states in their motion, several defense counsel with over 100 years of combined experience testified and submitted affidavits that the defense counsel in this case uh, conducted themselves properly typically for counsel representing a citizen accused of crimes and with due diligence and care. The court has no experience in representing a citizen accused of committing a crime. Ouch. And the motion goes on and says the court's commentary and findings of the court's commentary and findings of sloppiness, negligence, and incompetence are outside the issues not supported by the evidence gratuitous and unnecessary, demeaning, and have no legitimate purpose in relation to the court's order. And this is the, the line. In rulings on most of the defense pleadings, the court simply wrote, denied without hearing. The lack of such brevity with the contempt order illustrates the gratuitous nature of the demeaning comments. The comments and or findings referenced herein in other exhibition of the court's bias against, disdain for, and animus towards defense counsel. In addition, cause for recusal. So the question then becomes, is Judge Francis C. Gull going to recuse herself? Oh, I doubt it. You know, we talked about when the order came out and when it said that uh, the defense counsel were sloppy, negligent, and incompetent. It was like, ooh, ouch. Never heard somebody say that, but hey, that's, you know, Okay, judge, if that's what you want to do, that's what you're going to do. Anyway, uh, this is an interesting motion because it probably was completely unnecessary for the court to comment when everything else is simply stamped, denied without hearing. Boom. So I like the defense going after it. It's not going to change much of anything. But, hey, 
this little jousting match that's going on between the defense and the judge, it's a sideshow, but it's kind of interesting. And when you have a judge that really doesn't like the attorneys, the question is, is going to fall uh, negatively upon the defendant in this uh, particular case. All right. Some more Richard Allen news as well. Um, prosecutors have given notice uh, to the defense. And what they are saying is that they want a hearing on the admissibility of certain communications made by Mr. Richard Allen to a psychologist. And the prosecution uh, basically is alleging that Richard Allen has access to mental health services at the Indiana Department of Corrections, where he has been housed for safekeeping pursuant to uh, the court's order. Anyway, the mental health personnel employed by the Centurion Health uh, provide psychological uh, assistance and counseling to whom uh, Mr. Richard Allen has made statements, allegedly. In particular, those statements were made to a Dr. Monica Walla. Um, she is a uh, PhD psychologist licensed to practice in the state of Indiana. And apparently um, those statements fall within one of the exceptions to the confidentiality as it relates under Indiana code. In particular, they cite Indiana Code 25-33-1-17, and that's the privileged communication section between psychologist and clients. And it states, a psychologist licensed under this article may not disclose any information acquired from persons with whom the psychologist has dealt in a professional capacity, except under the following circumstances. Trials for homicide when the disclosure relates directly to the fact or immediate circumstances of said homicide. Ooh, that must mean there's some statements that go directly against the interest of Mr. Allen as it relates to the two murders in which he is charged against uh, Abby Williams and Libby German. Hmm, not good for the defense there, is it now? Anyway, the uh, prosecutors intend to offer into evidence the testimony of this Dr. Monica Walla, um, as documented in her reports entitled Department of Corrections, Behavioral Health Suicide Observation. Now, the state is seeking this uh, ruling for the sole purpose of expediting the presentation of evidence during trial and to put the defendant on notice as to the evidentiary exceptions and to obtain pre-trial admissibility. Ouch. Now, obviously, there's been a lot of talk as it relates to Mr. Allen. Yes, the defense has come up with this Odinistic fence that this, there was this ritualistic killing of the girls and there's no way that Mr. Allen could have done it. But there's allegedly several statements made by Mr. Allen, not only to his wife, but now to medical personnel, as well as to others that were watching him in this suicide watch that was taking place. Now, normally, anything a defendant says comes in as an admission by a party opponent and is therefore not hearsay under the rules of evidence. That's why defense attorneys always say, don't talk about your case to anyone because people somehow have this notion, only what they tell the police officer after they've been Mirandized can come in against them. No, it's anything as long as it meets the relevant standard under 401 of the rules of evidence. And it's not so unduly prejudicial under 403 right? That, so there's still the uh, prejudicial effect is not outweighed by its probative value. It comes in against the defendant. And that's why you always tell everyone to shut your mouth, but they don't do it. They never listen. So the defense has had to come up with this theory that Mr. Allen was so distraught uh, because of the circumstances in which he's been placed while in custody that he basically uh, made these statements and they're not true. Well, there's another rule of evidence that's basically, it's not hearsay, statement against penal interest. All right, think about it. And that's where you can have somebody else's statement saying, I did a crime, because that can come in um, as non-hearsay, because generally people don't go around stating they committed a crime unless they actually did it. Who would do that? It's a statement against penal interest, right? because you penal interest being you go to the penal colony, prison. So the defense, from what I can tell, has done a pretty good job on their alternate suspect stuff. Judge Frances Seagull is gonna do everything she can to keep that out. 
And then the biggest problem is obviously the statements by Mr. Allen allegedly made, and here allegedly made to a doctor who is probably very copious in her note-taking abilities. And she put it in there, and when they looked at his medical records because of the defenses that they've raised as it relates to statements being made, the prosecution gets access to those records. And therefore, that's going to be a big, big problem uh, for the defense. And now, like I said, I think the defense lost a little credibility. They were so adamant that they were ready to go, ready to go, ready to go. And then they had to waive speedy trial. So now the trial for Mr. Allen is into October. We'll just have to wait and see. Don't jump up and down and say you're ready and then not be, right? Same thing happened in the Brian Koberger case. No, we want a speedy trial. We want a speedy trial. And they're like, okay, let's go do it. And then the defense said, oh, we need more time. You lose credibility doing that. If you need more time, just say you need more time, but be honest about it. Next on the docket, more information as it relates to the Lakin Riley matter. A formal indictment in the Lakin Riley matter has been handed down and the man accused of killing the nursing student while she was out jogging on a trail at the University of Georgia earlier this year has been officially indicted on 10 charges. Now, one of those charges stems from a completely separate peeping Tom incident. Just so we're clear, the guy was looking through somebody's windows trying to see something that somebody probably didn't want him to take a look at. Yes, that is sex offender registry type of stuff. So this apparently, uh, this this peeping Tom incident allegedly involved a a University of Georgia staff member uh, earlier in the day. Now, as you may recall, Lake and Riley, who is only 22 and a nursing student, was found beaten to death on February 22nd. Uh, An immigrant by the name of Jose Ibarra was arrested and charged with her murder. Now, Ibarra is now also charged with peeping on the University of Georgia staff member, and the indictment accuses him of going to an apartment at the University Village Housing Building, Building S, and peeping through the window at the woman on the same day he is accused of killing Miss Riley. The indictment did not indicate if the peeping Tom incident took place before Miss Riley was killed, but one's probably going to assume it did. I'm just thinking this guy's looking through the windows. He's getting all this pent up energy, can't take it out. So what does he do? He sees Lake and Riley and does what he does. Anyway, the indictment also charged Ibarra with asphyxiating Riley, along with inflicting blunt force trauma to her head. Now, Mr. Ibarra was initially charged with seven counts, malice murder, felony murder, aggravated battery, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, kidnapping, hindering a 911 call, and concealing the death of another. The new indictment adds three charges, included aggravated assault with attempt to rape, tampering with evidence, and the peeping Tom charge. Now, the tampering with the evidence charge accuses him of hiding a jacket and gloves in an attempt to keep him from getting caught. Bad case. Bad case. Not a whodunit, that's for sure. We'll give everybody the presumption of innocence, but uh, that's one of those cases that was preventable uh, because, as you may recall, that gentleman was uh, in custody in New York on a felony case but got released. And then he made his way to Georgia. All right, next on the docket. There's always somebody that ruins it for everyone, right? So four airline employees, three from New York and one from New Jersey, are accused of uh, taking a uh, small cut of each shipment of money that they snuck through the special employee access lanes at the TSA checkpoints. And they put the money onto flights bound for the Dominican Republic. Now, all of the suspects had uh, special clearances with TSA under the uh, known crew member program. Now, under this uh, program, uh, they have a status that they can get expedited security lanes and they face less scrutiny. In effect, they're given these loosened security procedures because the privilege allows flight attendants to bypass airport security with large amounts of, oh, in this case, cash without that cash being seized. So Charlie Hernandez, Sarah Valerio Puyos, Emmanuel Torres, and Gerald Fabio each face federal felony charges of operating an unlicensed money transmission business and violating airport security requirements. Ooh, that last one's gonna sting. No, 
No, the money laundering is the one that's going to sting. Anyway, it's alleged that the defendants knowingly smuggled large amounts of illicit money linked to the sale of narcotics to include fentanyl and took advantage of the airport security checkpoint by using their trusted positions as flight attendants. Just can't go there. The trust. If you can't trust your flight attendant, who can you trust? Anyway, the investigation apparently has exposed some critical vulnerabilities in the airline security industry and has illuminated methods that narcotic traffickers are utilizing. These uh, flight attendants allegedly used the code word lotions to mean drug cash and allegedly checked in with their handlers for cargo in advance of flights to the uh, Caribbean nation and referred to the uh, smuggling rings drug dealing clients as Los Tigres, Spanish for the Tigers. When referring to stuff, they meant drugs, including fentanyl, that led to the illicit proceeds. Now, Mr. Hernandez is accused of smuggling at least $2.5 million between 2014 and 2019. And during that same time span, Mr. Pulios allegedly transported at least $1.5 million on flights to the Dominican Republic. And Torres and Fabio are accused of smuggling more than $1.5 million apiece between 2015 and last year, and they face up to 15 years in prison. Now, in exchange for getting the cash through the checkpoints, guess what? They would get about $1,000, maybe $2,000 per every 60000 smuggled. Wow, I don't think that's enough to risk all those years of your life in prison, but apparently they did. Now, Mr. Hernandez also faces some uh, conspiracy charges, uh, which takes his uh, cut potential cut up to in prison up to 20 years. Same with uh, Mr. Uh, Pulios for the count of bulk cash smuggling takes him up to possibly 25 years. Now, obviously, I say this ruins it for everybody because guess what? All those pilots, flight attendants, they're all now going to get extra screening just like everybody else. Now, isn't that terrible? Uh, in a way, yes, it is, because there's always somebody that ruins it for everybody. Attorneys used to be able to pass through the security by showing your bar card and your license, say, look, I'm an attorney, trust me. And there's always somebody that screws it up, and then we all punish, right? You should punish the person that conducted the act that got them in trouble. They shouldn't punish everybody else, but they will all be punished, and we will all be punished as well. Now, access lines for known crew personnel, um, I'm sure they weren't paying much attention to them because they were known personnel. They can be trusted. They're part of the team, right? And besides, they're spending too much time over there telling grandma to take her shoes off and um, scanning the walker or cane that grandma needs. I don't know. I had to fly commercial uh, last week, and it reminded me how miserable it is. And I have TSA and I have clear and it was still not a fun experience. And you wonder, well, why do I have all this stuff if I still have to take just about everything off of my person and shove it into a bag? It's always somebody that's gonna take advantage of their privilege, for sure. Next, big mistake. Cops are gonna pay on this one. And I mean, get out your checkbook. So a United States Air Force airman was killed at his home after police allegedly forced their way into the wrong apartment and shot him as his friend that he was FaceTiming with, she saw the whole thing. So Air Force senior airman Roger Fortson, this young man was 23 years old and apparently a very good airman, and I'll explain that in a minute. He was identified as the uh, young man that was uh, shot in the shooting last Friday afternoon, and it took place at an off-base residence in an apartment complex uh, down in Okaloosa, Florida. Now, the Okaloosa County deputy was responding to a report of a disturbance and reacted in self-defense, allegedly after he encountered a 23-year-old male armed with a gun, according to the police. Now, a witness who was on FaceTime with Mr. Forsen during the time of the shooting claimed that Forsen heard a knock at the door and asked who was there. He didn't receive a response, but heard another very aggressive knock. So Fortune peered through the peephole, but didn't see anyone and actually got a little concerned because why are people knocking on your door? So Mr. Fortune retrieved a firearm that he had, was completely authorized and legal to have. And when he returned to his living room with the gun, police allegedly pushed through the door and guess what they did? They saw him and shot him six times. 
The witness who was on the Facebook obviously was quite traumatized during the whole shooting and recalled that Forsen said, I can't breathe after the shots were fired. Mr. Forsen uh, was given aid, but ultimately died at the hospital. Now, the deputy involved in the incident has since been placed on administrative leave while the shooting continues to be investigated. Now, this young man was based at the Special Operations Wing at Holbert Field in Florida. He went on active duty in 2019, and he was assigned to the 4th Special Operations Squadron as a special missions aviator, where one of his roles was member of the squadron of the AC-130 gunship, the Ghost Rider aircrew, you know, the one where they fly around and they shoot a howitzer-sized cannon out the side of an airplane? Yeah, this guy. He didn't get there because he was some kind of a dirtbag. No, this guy was a good kid. And we'll have to wait and see. I'm sure, there should be body cam images, but the cop got it wrong. Should he be charged? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Now, the one thing I don't like is the family here, in this case, has gotten Mr. Crump, um, Benjamin Crump. I just don't like that guy. Uh, I know he's doing their job. Everybody's entitled to an attorney. But this guy, I don't see this as some sort of racial thing. This is just a cop that got it wrong that killed a young man. He's certainly not going to be a cop anymore. Uh, shouldn't be. But um, I don't see it as a racial thing. But we'll wait and see. Condolences to the family, that young man. Someone who has a uh, son in the Air Force just uh, um, scares the hell out of you. You expect him, something's going to happen, you know, because they're out flying a dangerous mission somewhere, not being shot at their apartment. Unbelievable. Next, a high-speed chase with a supercar that has been stolen. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the suspected driver, this guy, Elliot Duggan, was uh, pulled over by police back in uh, April at about uh, 5 a.m because the police saw him what they believed to be asleep at the wheel, so they initiated a quick traffic stop. Now, after the uh, police ran his license and registration, the officers found that he had multiple felony warrants. And guess what? That supercar that he was sleeping in, it was stolen. So as he was ordered to get out of the car, Mr. Duggan argued, and what did he do? Sped away and uh, reached some speeds of about 113 miles an hour until he collided, ooh, with that median. And that sent him about 100 feet down the road, right? It's not the speed that gets you, ladies and gentlemen. It's the sudden stop that hurts. Needless to say, Mr. Duggan is now completely asleep at the wheel. And uh, it was not a, a rental as he uh, said that it was. So the, unfortunately, the whole crash didn't get to, onto the uh, uh, body cam anyway. As Mr. Duggan sped off, things didn't end so well because uh, he's now completely asleep forever. I'm not, I don't know what to say other than what could possibly go wrong. Anyway, finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. I get it. People get hangry and they, they want their food and they want it done right. But listen to this story. A guy goes into Subway and he goes ballistic on a group of workers at a subway when they refuse to put extra meat on his sandwich forcing the store manager out wherever they were working and uh, now she's going to have possibly permanent injuries so the manager a woman by the name of monique larios was called into work after her employees argued with a customer over the amount of ham on his sandwich this took place in uh, california now the customer uh, was identified as George Sandoval. He claimed that he had paid the uh, amount for the double meat that was already put on his sandwich. And then Sandoval demanded that the workers put 12 extra slices of ham on the sandwich instead of the six extra he had uh, paid for. And then the uh, arguing began. Anyway, the customer then walked around to the counter and started punching Miss Larios. Uh, now, Miss Larios obviously didn't expect it when he came around the corner and said, uh, what are you going to do? Hit me over ham? Well, yes, that's what he did. Uh, so Miss Larios got punched over ham. Can't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. Now, when Mr. Uh, Sandoval, who uh, was significantly larger than uh, Miss uh, Larios was done, Miss Larios had a black eye. She's four foot 11. The other guy, Mr. Sandoval, six foot 400 pounds. Wow, Mr. Sandoval. Anyway, a uh, customer 
uh, got the big guy, Mr. Sandoval, off Miss Larios. And, you know, Mr. Sandoval then struck the uh, customer at least three times. And uh, then he ran away. Mr. Sandoval was ultimately arrested in uh, the same day and charged with a battery. Now, Mr. Sandoval, are you a dumb criminal of the day because you beat up a woman over ham? Uh, well, kind of, yes. But um, you're a dumb criminal because uh, you beat up a woman over ham, you're going to jail, and frankly, at 400 pounds, the last thing you need is some extra ham, Mr. Sandoval. That's why you've been catapulted to the upper echelon of dumb criminals and awarded the prize of dumb criminal of the day. You can't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Thank you all for watching. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. And yes, the Constitution matters. It does. We'll see you next time.